Hello everyone, and welcome back once again to C++ Real-Time Audio Programming with Bella. We've been working through a series of programming topics in parallel with a set of music and audio processing topics, and today we're going to start a deep dive into one of the most powerful and flexible forms of audio processing. This is based on processing audio in blocks of samples at a time, rather than one sample at a time as we've been doing with filters. The reason that this approach is so powerful is that it lets us make various mathematical transformations of our audio signal, most notably transforming our signal into the frequency domain using something called the fast Fourier transform. Ultimately, this block-based technique will allow us to create a category of audio processing effects known as the phase vocoder. In this lecture, we're going to lay down the foundations of how to process audio in blocks, so that in the next lecture we can look in more detail at some of the things that we can do with the phase vocoder. In this lecture, then, you'll learn how to take a real-time audio signal and divide it up into successive windows or blocks for further processing. We're going to learn the basics of the Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT, which is a way that we can extract the frequency content of each of the blocks. We'll see shortly why that's so powerful. In this lecture, we're also going to look more at Bella's browser-based GUI capability. Specifically, we'll see how you can send data from your program to a GUI running in the browser to visualize aspects of your audio signals. By the end of this lecture, you're going to make two simple audio spectrum analyzers, which are based on the FFT. The first of these is going to use LEDs to show the high and low frequency content of the signal, and the second of these will show a real-time plot of the full audio spectrum. As always, the companion materials, including the code examples, can be found on the GitHub link at the bottom of the screen. Because we're about to dive into a topic with a fair bit of mathematical complexity, I want to revisit the overall aims of this lecture series. There are many, many good resources on learning digital signal processing that will let you take a particular specification and design a series of equations or block diagrams which implement that specification. That is not the goal of this course. Rather, in this course, we presume that you already have a system design, and your challenge is to implement it in real-time audio code. So with that in mind, if you'd like a more formal and detailed introduction into the mathematics of what we're about to look at, there are a number of good resources that you can find. Amongst them are several textbooks that you can see here, which are also listed on the companion materials for this lecture. To run the code in this lecture, as usual, you'll need a Bella starter kit or a Bella mini starter kit. One of the examples that we're going to work with today uses a couple LEDs to visualize the audio signal. Therefore, you'll need two LEDs and two associated resistors, along with the breadboard and the usual jumper wires. Otherwise, all the materials will run on the board using the browser-based GUI. Okay then, let's get started. What do we mean by block-based processing? Block-based processing refers to audio calculations that run on a group or block of samples all simultaneously. Typically, the idea is that we wait for a collection of samples to arrive, and then once they've arrived, we can process them all at once. So for example, we might have some calculation that we want to run every 512 samples. We wait for the 512 samples to arrive, and then we run a calculation on all of them at once. We then go on and wait for the next 512 samples to arrive before we run the calculation again, and we can continue block by block indefinitely. Now, of course, we've seen plenty of other types of audio processing, including filters, that might also make use of the current and previous values of the audio signal. The difference here with block-based processing is that we're not going to do the calculation every single output sample. Rather, we're going to wait for a specified number of samples to come in, then we're going to run the calculation on the block. Now, I want to emphasize that block-based processing is not the same thing as non-real-time or offline processing of audio signals. This is not necessarily what happens in an audio editor where you have the entire signal in front of you at the same time. Rather, what we're doing is we're chunking the signal up into finite segments and working on each of those segments at a time. That could happen in real-time or it could happen not in real-time, and that's just up to our implementation. The question then becomes how we generate one of these blocks. A term that you'll hear frequently in this domain is the window. The idea is that you have a window function which has a non-zero value only for a finite fixed number of samples and a zero at all other values. By multiplying the audio signal by your window function, you end up with a result that is non-zero only for a finite number of samples and zero everywhere else. So when we talk about windowing a signal, we're talking about multiplying it by a succession of window functions, each of which isolates only a finite length of the signal. The simplest window function is the rectangular window, which has a value of 1 for a finite number of samples and 0 everywhere else. Window functions also come in many other commonly used shapes. Here we see a triangular window, 
When we multiply by this window, it has the effect of feathering the edges of the signal, so there's no abrupt discontinuity at the beginning and the end. In the next lecture, we'll look a little bit more at the different types of window functions that we might use and why. For now, it suffices to say that any arbitrarily long signal can be divided into a succession of windows, and that this segmentation can be done in real time as the signal is coming in, like this. We'll see in a moment how to write the code that does this segmentation. Now, it turns out that in the right set of circumstances, it's possible to take each of these individual windows and reconstruct the original signal with no loss of data. To be able to do that depends on a certain set of conditions, including what kinds of window functions we use and to what extent they overlap. We can summarize these conditions as something called the constant overlap add criterion, which basically means that when we add up all the window functions together, they should add up to a constant value. We'll come back to this more in the next lecture. To summarize our terminology then, block-based processing refers to the segmentation of our signal into successive windows, which we then process one window at a time. Now there's actually quite a few reasons that we might process a block of signals at a time, but by far the most common reason to do so is to use something called the Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT. The FFT is a computational algorithm which efficiently implements a mathematical concept called the Discrete Fourier Transform, or DFT. So therefore, when you hear the terms DFT or FFT, we're talking about the same mathematical process, just a different way of implementing it. The DFT is a tremendously powerful tool to extract the frequency content from a block of samples. The intuitive explanation here builds on some of the things we saw earlier with additive synthesis, and that is that any discrete time signal can be expressed as a sum of a finite number of sinusoidal components. So suppose that this is our original signal x of n. We have 16 points sampled over time with values of n between 0 and 15. We can represent this signal exactly as a sum of sinusoidal components. So let's start these one by one. First we have a component with a frequency of 0. We can add to that a component with a frequency of pi over 8, add to that a frequency of 3 pi over 8, 5 pi over 8, and 7 pi over 8. And it turns out that when we add these components together with the right amplitudes and phases, we exactly get our original 16 samples in time. In this example, I've only shown you five different components. In the more general case, when we have 16 time samples, we might need up to 16 different sinusoids to fully represent this signal. But the other components in this case either have an amplitude of zero or they duplicate the ones that I've already shown you. So with that in mind, what the discrete Fourier transform does is it gives us the amplitudes and the phases of each sinusoidal component that we need to reconstruct this signal. In this case, the DFT of the signal I just showed you looks like this. So we can draw an exact correspondence between the samples of the DFT and the components that we looked at a moment ago, like this. The plot that I'm showing on the screen here is the magnitude or amplitude of each of these components. It's also possible from the DFT to get the phase of each of the components. To briefly summarize then, every signal can be represented as a sum of sinusoids, and what the DFT does is that it gives us the amplitudes and the phases of those sinusoids. Now this is incredibly powerful stuff, and the Fast Fourier Transform has absolutely transformed the realm of digital signal processing, not only for audio. In the case of audio, we see a couple broad categories of applications of the FFT. The first of these we could broadly describe as audio analysis. In the very simplest case, we can calculate a spectrum of a signal, which is a localized snapshot of its frequency content. We can also plot a spectrogram, which shows how the frequency content evolves over time. These things basically come directly out of block-based processes using the FFT. It's also possible from there to calculate progressively higher level features about the audio signal and potentially plug them into machine learning algorithms or other forms of intelligent signal processing. This whole domain is known as music informatics or music information retrieval, and it's really changed the face of the music industry over the past decade or so. Outside of the musical domain, other applications of FFT-based audio analysis include speech recognition and audio event detection in various environments. Another broad category of applications of the FFT involves sonic transformation and resynthesis from the frequency domain. The idea here is typically that we take an audio signal, we chunk it up into successive windows, we apply the FFT of those windows to get the frequency content, then we can manipulate that frequency content and finally resynthesize it back into a new audio signal. 
Many applications of this type of audio processing are collectively known as the phase vocoder. We're going to see this in the next lecture, but the applications include things like pitch shifting, denoising, or cross-synthesis of multiple audio signals. It's also a kind of interesting note that the human ear works as a kind of biological Fourier transform. The cells inside the inner ear are organized so that different locations are sensitive to different frequencies, so the neural signals that ultimately reach our brain have effectively already been processed by a kind of time-to-frequency transformation. Okay then, for this lecture, what we're ultimately interested in is how to build a practical system that does this block-based transformation in real time. It's useful to once again contrast what we're trying to do here from what we've seen before working with filters. Recall that the FIR, or Finite Impulse Response Filter, takes the current and previous values of the audio input to calculate the current value of the audio output. One of the properties of the filter is that a new output is calculated each successive audio sample. Therefore, our FIR filtering code is going to have to run once for each audio frame. The similar situation applies to the IIR filter. Here, we use the current input and the previous inputs and outputs to calculate the current value of the output. But like the FIR filter, we're going to run this calculation once per audio frame. The difference with block-based processing is that we're only going to run the calculation once per block. In this particular example, I have a block size of six samples, and once I have all six samples, then I'm going to run the calculation. Then I'm going to wait till the next six samples are available and run the calculation again, repeating this once per block. As we'll see in a bit, the size of our block and the interval between the calculations may be the same or it may be different. One other very important note is that the size of our window is not necessarily the same thing as our real-time audio buffer size. Remember that whenever we process audio in real-time, our render function is not called every sample but once per block of samples. The size of that block, which is given to us by the system, has no relation to the size of the windows or the frequency of the calculations that we might do in our particular audio processing system, and it's just important not to get confused with the terminology. We might need multiple calls to render before we have a single window of signal to process, or a window might fill up somewhere in the middle of the call to render and need to be processed. Let's look then at how we actually fill up one of these windows of samples. The idea in this example is that we're going to fill a window and once we have the window full, we're going to call an FFT on it. And the size of our window is N samples. What we need to do is as follows. First of all, in our initialization code at the top of the file or in our setup function, we'll need to declare a buffer or array to hold the window of samples. On Bella, this will typically be of type float and it will need to hold at least N samples. The next thing we need to do is in the render function, as we're processing the samples that have come in, we need to store them in this array or buffer. We also need to keep track of how many samples have been stored in the buffer, which means that we're going to need a global variable to remember how many samples have been stored. Once we've filled up all n samples in the buffer, then we've got our complete window. We can now multiply the contents of the buffer by the window function. If we have a rectangular window, there's no need to do this because it has a value of one for all the samples that we care about, but other types of windows, this multiplication would need to be done. Once we've applied the window function, then we can perform our FFT on the resulting block of samples. Then once we've done that, we can handle any processing we want to do in the frequency domain. Finally, once we've done all that, we need to reset our counter back to zero so that we can start filling the buffer all over again to have the next window of samples. I've said this already, but it's really important, so I'll just reiterate. The size of the windows for our block-based process is very likely not the same thing as the system audio buffer size. On Bella, the system audio buffer size is often quite small, something like 16 samples, whereas typically we choose a much larger window size, which is based on the kind of resolution we want in time and frequency. We'll see more about that in a little bit. The upshot of all of this is that we cannot just take the raw audio buffer that came in inside the Bella context and pass it into our FFT. We need to declare this separate buffer to hold the incoming samples as they come in and keep count of how many samples we've stored. Moreover, even though the audio is coming in in blocks and not one sample at a time, we should do all of this audio processing in the for loop that we typically write within render, which steps through it one sample at a time. Here's a very simple example of the kind of global variables that you would need to declare to do this block-based processing, and some comments to indicate the structure of what would need to happen inside of your render function. Okay, so let's have a different look at what we need to do here. Suppose that we're processing our audio in real time, and it's coming in in blocks of eight samples. Again, that's the system audio buffer size. That is not necessarily the size of the window that we want to be filling up for our block-based processing.
What we want to do is we want to process it in windows of six samples. So we've declared an input buffer, which has six slots in it. And we're going to have a write pointer, which is going to keep track of how many samples are stored in the input buffer at this immediate moment. Inside of our render function, we're going to go through the for loop, which counts through the number of samples in that particular block. And what we need to do is copy the samples from the audio input into the buffer. Once we get to six samples, then the buffer has filled up. We have a complete window of samples at this point. If we had a non-rectangular window, we could multiply that buffer by the window function. And once that's done, we can pass it to the FFT or any other sort of block-based processing that we wanted to do. Having processed the first block of samples, we now reset and do the same thing with the next block. So starting from input sample six, we're going to once again fill up our input buffer. Once we've filled up all six samples, we can apply the window function again, and we can once again calculate the block-based process, FFT or something else. And we can keep on doing this for each successive block of samples. Notice again that we're not calling the block-based processing every single sample like we did with a filter. We're only calling it once per buffer or once per every six samples in this case. Now, for today's first task, I don't want to worry too much about what the block-based process itself is. Rather, I'm interested in this process of segmenting and windowing the signal, and that's what we're going to work on in this code example. In the companion materials, you'll find the example called FFT LED. What this code is doing is segmenting the signal into windows, calculating an FFT on each window, and then using the FFT to get a simple measure of energy in the low and high frequencies. It's going to use that to blink a couple LEDs. So the first step before you write any code is to hook up two LEDs with resistors as shown here. This is the version for the Bella Mini. Once you've done that, then you need to implement the code in the project which is responsible for segmenting the signal into windows. The steps are as follows. You'll need to declare a global variable, which is an array of size GFFT size. This is going to hold the window of samples. You'll also need to keep a global variable, which is a counter for how many samples have been put in the buffer so far. As we've seen, that's also sometimes called the write pointer because it points to the next available slot that we can write to. Once you've done those things, then your attention should shift to the render function. Inside of the for loop in the render function, you need to store the current sample into the buffer as it comes in. You need to increment the counter, and when the counter reaches the buffer size, then it's time to call the process FFT function. The process FFT function is already finished for you. It calculates the energy for the low and the high frequencies. But then what you need to do is once that function is finished, you need to reset the counter back to zero so that we can start counting all over again for the next window. One final thing you need to do before you can run the project is you need to download the drum loop WAV file from Freesound. The link to it is distributed in the project, but the sound file itself is not part of the download. Once this is working, you should be able to run the project and see the LEDs blinking in synchrony with the drum loop. Another thing you can try, especially if you don't actually have any LEDs, is to open Bella's GUI and you should be able to see a couple virtual LEDs in the browser that also blink in synchrony with the project. So try that as well. We'll talk about that aspect more once we've looked at the code. Pause the video here. All right, here we have the finished code example, and we're gonna skip over a few aspects of this. For example, I'm not going to talk about the FFT in detail right now. However, we need to look at what we need to do to implement the block-based processing. Here we have the global variables that we needed to declare. First of all, we have the array, which we're implementing as a C++ vector of type float. We're calling that G input buffer. We also have the write pointer or sample count, which we're calling G input buffer pointer. Notice that starts at a value of zero because the buffer starts empty. Now, before we get to render, it's important that we start this vector out being large enough to hold the entire buffer. Otherwise, we could find ourselves allocating memory inside of render, which could lead to underruns. So inside of setup here, I'm calling this method called resize. The resize method of the C++ vector class causes the vector to allocate enough memory to hold this many elements. Otherwise, the setup code is largely the same as it was. We can see here there's the process FFT method. As I discussed, I'm not going to talk about the contents of this method right now. We'll just simply say that it calls an FFT on the buffer that we pass in, and then does some simple calculations to calculate the energy in the low and the high frequencies. From there, it decides whether certain thresholds have been exceeded, and then it sets the value of the LEDs accordingly.
The interesting code is happening inside of render, and this is where our code needed to be written. Here we have the code that implements the segmentation and windowing of the signal. First of all, we take the input sample, which came from our audio file player, and we store it inside the input buffer in the location indicated by the input buffer pointer. We also increment the pointer so that it now points to the next sample in the buffer. We check if the pointer has reached the end of the buffer. If that's the case, then the window is full and it's time to process it. If we had a window function that was not rectangular, this would be the place we multiplied by the window, but we don't need to do that here. Instead, we just take the buffer we've filled up and pass it to process FFT. At the end of it, we reset the pointer back to zero, which will cause the process to repeat all over again. The rest of this code is as it was before. We're calling digital write to set the two LEDs based on the global variables that were calculated inside of the process FFT function. We're also writing the real-time audio to our audio output so we can hear what's going on. Finally, we have some bits involving the Bella GUI. I'm not gonna talk about that at this immediate moment because first I want to run the project and see the LEDs going. So let's do that now. And here we can see the LEDs blinking in synchrony with the audio. Now we can also see something similar in the Bella browser-based GUI, so let's open that now. So here I've written a simple simulation of the two LEDs. Now if you watch closely, you'll see that the actual physical LEDs are always a little bit ahead of the browser-based LEDs. That's not an artifact of the video. You'll find that the browser GUIs always have a bit of latency compared to any physical hardware that you might attach to the Bella board. A lot of that is actually on the browser side, so there's not a whole lot that we can do about it. All I can say about that is that the browser is probably better used for things that are not tremendously time sensitive, and if you have things where low latency is extremely important, I recommend you do that in physical hardware. Before we get back to talking about what was happening with the FFT, I want to have a closer look at the GUI code here, so let's do that now. As we just saw, Bella lets us write a custom browser-based GUI for our project. Typically, these GUIs are written in the P5.js framework, which is basically the processing language implemented in JavaScript. Processing is particularly good at doing graphics and interaction, and it's quite easy to learn. To implement a GUI in our Bella project, we'll need to have a file called sketch.js. That will implement the code for drawing the GUI. The question then is how do we get data from the Bella program across to the GUI to render it in the browser? The way we do it is using a WebSocket connection from Bella to the browser. It's actually possible to send data both directions this way, but we're only going to look at Bella to browser in today's lecture. So here's how we communicate from C++ to the JavaScript GUI. First, in our C++ file, we need to include the GUI library. That's this line here. In our render.cpp file, we need to make an object of type GUI. We'll give it a suitable name like GLED GUI. Then inside of the setup method, which runs at the beginning of the program, we need to initialize the GUI object. That involves calling the GUI object setup method where we pass it the name of our project. Finally, actually passing the data to the GUI involves calling a method called sendBuffer, which will send data of our choice across the WebSocket connection. Here's the code inside of render that does that. We saw this just a moment ago. At the top of this code, we have an if statement which is responsible for rate limiting how often we're sending the data to the GUI. We're keeping a counter, which is a global variable, we're incrementing at every sample, and when it exceeds 1 one hundredth of the sample rate, it's time to send data to the GUI. Here, we're assembling a buffer of data that we're going to send across. We've declared an array called GGUI buffer. It's an array of type float, and it has two elements. The first of them is the value of the LED for the low frequencies. The second element is the value of the LED for the high frequencies. The next thing that we do is we check whether the GUI is running. This prevents us sending a lot of messages from Bella if nobody is there to receive it. If the GUI is connected, we call the send buffer method, and this takes two arguments. The first argument of send buffer is a number that indicates which buffer number we are sending. By passing different numbers here, our GUI can receive multiple different kinds of data with different meanings. Here we only have one buffer to send, so it is a value of zero. Then the second argument is the buffer that we want to send. The GUI library is really flexible. You can send any data type or any array of vector of any data type to the GUI. Here we're sending an array of floats. Now what picks that up is the sketch.js file, which is inside of the same project. The buffer that we sent will be received by these lines of code. We can always find them at bella.data.buffers. 
bella.data.buffers is an array, and each element of the array corresponds to one particular buffer number that we would have sent. Here we sent everything in buffer number 0, so element 0 of Bella data buffers will give us our low and high LED outputs. Of course, that is itself an array, so we have to use an additional array index to get the low and the high outputs, which we're storing in the variables called LED low and LED high. Back over to the browser, we can see those lines in context here. You can see that they're implemented inside of a function called draw. All of this is written in JavaScript, and we're not going to get into the details of JavaScript programming or writing GUIs in this particular lecture series, but at least you can see how the communication works from your Bella program to the GUI. Now, at this point, having implemented the mechanics of block-based processing, let's go back and talk a little bit more about what the Fast Fourier Transform is actually doing. As we discussed, the FFT is a computational algorithm which is an efficient way of calculating the DFT, which is a mathematical formula to give us the frequency content of any finite length signal. For this particular example, we saw these particular frequency components added up to the original signal, and the values of the DFT gave us the amplitudes and phases. But what about the frequencies of the components? How do we know where those come from? The DFT divides up the signal into linearly spaced frequency components between 0 and 2 pi. Therefore, we can calculate the frequency of every component with the formula 2 pi k over n, where k is going to have a value between 0 and n minus 1. Each of these amplitude and phase measurements is known as a bin, and collectively, these n bins are known as the frequency domain representation of the signal, in contrast to the original samples which we call the time domain. The important point here is that we started from n samples in the time domain and we got out n samples in the frequency domain. These are not two different signals, they're two different mathematical perspectives on the same signal, one representing the samples over time, the other representing amplitudes and phases of particular frequency components. The DFT, then, is the tool that takes us from the time domain representation to the frequency domain representation. There is also an inverse DFT, or inverse FFT, which is the fast algorithm implementing it, which takes us back from the frequency domain to the time domain. Under the right conditions, we can take the DFT of a signal, the inverse DFT, and get out an exact reconstruction of where we started. The condition for this being the case is that the length of the signal in the time domain, m, must be less than or equal to the length of the DFT, n. Most often we'll see that these two things are exactly the same. At this point, we're ready to look at the maths behind this. Here we see the formula for calculating the discrete Fourier transform. Again, the FFT is exactly the same formula as this, just an efficient algorithm for calculating it. One precondition to making the FFT fast is to have n be a power of 2. This is known as the cooley tukey algorithm named after its inventors, and it was really this algorithm making the DFT efficient that created the revolution in signal processing. Let's unpack the formula, though. What's this saying? We're saying that each frequency bin x of k is a sum. The sum is calculated for all time samples n between 0 and the length n minus 1. Each element of the sum consists of the original time domain signal x of n multiplied by a complex exponential whose frequency is given by 2 pi k over n. What is k then? Well, k is the index of the frequency bin. So in other words, what's different from one frequency bin to the next of the DFT is the frequency of the complex exponential that we're multiplying the signal by. Now, complex exponential, what does that mean? We won't go into the details of this, but essentially raising e to the power of a complex number ends up producing a periodic sinusoidal component. Now, as we just saw, there is also an inverse discrete Fourier transform whose implementation is the inverse FFT, or IFFT. This takes us from the frequency domain to the time domain. The formula here is effectively the inverse of the DFT. The main thing to note is the scaling factor at the beginning. We have to divide the values by 1 divided by the FFT length, big N. Now, a few comments on this. Our audio signals always consist of real numbers. But our frequency bins from the DFT are typically going to be complex numbers. Recall that complex numbers are a plus b times j, where j is the imaginary number square root of negative 1. How then do we make sense of the complex numbers? We can't just ignore the imaginary component. Instead, what we typically do is we calculate the magnitude of each frequency bin. To do that, we use this formula, the square root of a squared plus b squared. When you see a plot of a spectrum or a spectrogram, typically what you're seeing is this magnitude plot. However, it's also possible to get the phase of each of the bins. This is given by the arctan of b divided by a, the imaginary component divided by the real component. 
Phase becomes extremely important when we get into phase vocoder audio effects, which we'll see in the next lecture. We've seen before that the frequency of each bin is equally spaced between 0 and 2 pi. The formula here, 2 pi k over n, is what's giving us that equal spacing. When we deal with sampled analog signals, we know that 2 pi corresponds to the original analog sampling rate. But this should raise a bit of a question for us. The frequency of pi we've seen before represents the Nyquist rate, which is supposed to be the highest frequency that we can actually represent with a sample digital signal. But then if that's the case, why does our DFT give us frequency bins that have a higher frequency than pi? What are those bins supposed to mean? It turns out that our higher frequency bins with a frequency above pi don't actually contain any unique useful information for our audio signals. The reason for this is that the DFT is a general mathematical concept which can work with complex valued time domain signals. However, our audio signals are always strictly real valued. When we pass a real signal into the DFT, the frequency bins that come out are conjugate symmetric. What that means is that we can always calculate the value of bin n minus k as the complex conjugate of bin k. In other words, the only unique information that we'll find about our audio signal is contained in bin 0 to n over 2. So it makes some sense then that when we plot the audio spectrum of a signal, it'll typically stop at the Nyquist frequency, which is n over 2, even though the FFT will actually give us more bins than that. Returning briefly to our initial example, you can see the symmetry of the DFT here. Because we're only plotting the magnitude of each bin, it looks exactly symmetric around bin number 8. I'm going to move back now to talking about the mechanics of doing block-based processing. What we're going to see next is a common case where the size of our block or window is not the same as the spacing between them. In this example, we'll look at a window size of 6 samples calculated every 4 samples. So the first window is going to hold samples 0 through 5, then the next window will be drawn from samples 4 through 9, 8 through 13, and so forth. So in other words, there is overlap between successive windows. Some samples of our audio signal will fall at the end of one window and also at the beginning of the next. How should we adapt our windowing code to handle this overlap? Previously, we filled up an entire buffer. When the buffer was full, we calculated the FFT on it, and then we emptied it and started from zero again. A more general approach, which will help us with this overlap, is to always keep a running history of our input samples. That is to say, we're going to have a buffer where at any time we can always find the last window of samples. We've seen in earlier lectures a kind of structure that does exactly this. Perhaps you remember what it is. It's the circular buffer. It's a computationally efficient way of keeping a running history of our signal. What our code will do is that once every so often, we're going to pass the most recent samples from the circular buffer into our FFT. The interval between these calculations is known as the hop size. Thus, you'll often see in block-based processing code a distinction made between window size and hop size, with hop size typically being a smaller number. Let's briefly review what goes into a circular buffer. It is essentially just an array of memory with a pointer attached to it which keeps track of where the newest samples are being stored. So in this particular case, we have a 24 element circular buffer. It's currently holding the values x of 0 through x of 23. When x of 24 comes in, the write pointer is going to tell us which element we should overwrite, which in this case is the oldest value. Once we've done that, we need to advance the write pointer so that the next sample that comes in, x of 25, also overwrites the oldest sample in the buffer. And we can go along this way indefinitely. So you can see that at any given time, the buffer always holds the 24 most recent samples, but not necessarily in incrementing order. An intuitive way to think about this that gives rise to the name is to think about the region of memory as being a literal circle. The right pointer is always going to tell you where the next sample is going to be stored, and we can always go counterclockwise around the circle to find the earlier samples. So as the new values come in, we store them, overriding the oldest samples, and then we advance the right pointer. There is no beginning or end to the circular buffer. There's nothing special about the first sample in memory or the last sample in memory. We're simply incrementing the pointer from beginning to end and then wrapping it around to the beginning again. The reason that this is a useful data structure is first of all, each individual sample never moves in memory until it's eventually replaced, which helps us with efficiency. The other reason that this is useful is that at any given time, we can always get the latest window of signal as long as the buffer is big enough. When, in earlier lectures, we implemented this in code, we saw that we needed two things to do it. We needed an array of memory to hold the samples themselves, and the right pointer to keep track of where we are. 
so far, this should look really similar to how we did our block-based processing so far. The main difference is that there's no functional beginning or ending to the circular buffer. We write samples from beginning to end, and when the pointer reaches the end of the buffer, we wrap it back to the beginning again and carry on in exactly the same way. I'm going through this description of circular buffers very quickly. For the full details on how they work and how to implement them, see lecture 11 of this series. In this lecture, we're going to use a circular buffer to keep track of the most recent input so that we can do block-based processing with the window size different than the hop size. If we're working with a window of size M, then our circular buffer needs to store at least M samples. To use it for block-based processing, then we're going to have to put some code inside of our for loop inside render. Writing the samples to the circular buffer will work as it usually does. Each iteration of the for loop, we store our input sample in the buffer, we increment the write pointer, and then we wrap it around as necessary. We'll also need to do one additional thing that we didn't need to do before, which is that we need to keep a separate counter of how many samples have elapsed since the last hop. When that count reaches the hop size, that means it's time to calculate another window of signal and pass it to the FFT. So what we do is extract from the circular buffer the most recent window of signal, unwrap it, and then pass that to the FFT. Now, what do we mean by unwrap? What we mean is copying those samples somewhere so that they end up straightforwardly in increasing order with zero at the beginning of the array and the last sample at the end. One important note is that the hop size of our block-based process probably has no relationship whatsoever to when the right pointer wraps around in the circular buffer. Remember, the beginning and end of the circular buffer have no significance at all, so that's why it's up to us to maintain a separate variable to count how many samples have elapsed since the last hop. Here now is what we need to do to unwrap the samples from our circular buffer. It might be stored in memory in a way that the earliest sample is not necessarily at the beginning of the buffer, but if we need to extract a window with the most recent samples, they might not be in contiguous order. So what we're going to need to do is copy different regions of memory from the circular buffer into a new array where they can be stored in increasing order. Generally speaking, it's still more efficient to use a circular buffer and do this copying once every hop than it is to be moving the samples in a straightforward linear buffer every single audio frame. All right then, let's summarize where we've gotten to with block-based processing. We've been looking at examples that consist of analysis only, taking an input signal, transforming it into the frequency domain, but not worrying about the output just yet. These block-based processes are defined by happening at regular intervals and not happening every single frame like a filter would. They typically involve a window of signal, and we can talk about the window size, sometimes known as the block size, which of course is different than the real-time block size of the Bella audio system. We also talk about the hop size, which tells us how many samples elapse between one window and the next. The hop size will often be smaller than the window size. For example, it might be half or one quarter of the window size. And with the right combination of window function and hop size, it's often possible to perfectly reconstruct the original signal from those windows. To implement the block-based process, we're using a circular buffer, which is always going to keep track of the most recent window of samples. This will, as usual, involve an array and a write pointer to store it, and then we also separately from that need to keep a counter of how many frames have elapsed, which is different than the write pointer into the circular buffer. This counter will tell us when we've reached the hop size, and when that happens, it's time to extract and unwrap one window and perform our FFT calculations. We're moving toward the next task, which will involve plotting the real-time audio spectrum of the signal. An audio spectrum is a plot which has frequency on the x-axis and the magnitude of each frequency bin on the y-axis. By convention, audio spectrum plots typically have a logarithmic decibel scale on the y-axis, and the x-axis can be either linear or logarithmic. As we saw earlier, we only need to plot the first half of the bins that come out of our DFT, because the higher bins are simply the mirror image of the lower ones. This will then give us a plot that goes from zero frequency up to the Nyquist rate, which is the highest frequency that we can represent with a sampled signal. The audio spectrum is intended to be a local snapshot of the frequency content of the signal. We're going to use a finite length window to do this, and we're going to recalculate it periodically at each hop. We're not attempting to calculate the frequency content of an entire audio file, for example. This then brings us to the task. There's a project in the companion materials called FFT Circular Buffer. This contains much of the same code as the previous project. What's missing here is the code to implement the circular buffer itself. There are some variables declared for you, but you're going to need to use these to implement the circular buffer behavior. You'll also need to work with the additional global variable called ghopcounter to keep track of how many samples have gone by between hops. 
The hop size is declared for you at the top of the file, and when the hop counter reaches that size, then you should call process FFT, resetting the counter back to zero. Now, process FFT will take your raw circular buffer as an argument. The other thing you therefore need to do is you need to write the code to unwrap the circular buffer. You need to find the most recent window of signal inside of the buffer, and you need to put it into a new buffer in the proper order, where the oldest sample is at the beginning and the latest sample is at the end. My recommendation is to use modulo indexing, which we saw in lecture 11, to do this. When you're done with this project and you run it, you should be able to open the Bella GUI and you should see a real-time plot of the audio spectrum. Pause the video and try it. Before finishing today, let's put just a couple extra features on our spectrum plotter. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to add peak detection to the plot. Peak detection typically stores the most recent maximum value of the signal, and in this case we're going to store the most recent peak value for each of the frequency bins of the FFT. To do that, we're going to need to declare a global variable, which is an array which can hold the peak value of each frequency bin. Your additional code is going to happen inside of process FFT. After the FFT has been calculated, what you need to do is iterate through each of the bins that came out and check whether its current value is greater than the stored value of the peak. If so, the value of the peak needs to update to reflect this new higher value. But of course, we don't want our peak detector to get stuck at the largest values that we've ever seen, so each peak value also needs to be multiplied by some kind of decay factor each frame so that it gradually decreases in value. I suggest trying a value around 0.98 for a reasonably good effect. Once you've calculated this peak spectrum, you can send this to the GUI. We saw earlier how to send data to the GUI using the send buffer method. Here you're going to do it exactly the same as before, but you're going to give it a buffer ID of 1 rather than 0. That way the GUI can receive two different spectra and it can plot them both at the same time. That's a good place to start and see if your code runs that way. But once you've got it working, there's one further task to try, which is to add some degree of frequency smoothing to the peak spectrum. Here, what I suggest is that you calculate a local average of the nearest frequency bins to smooth out some of the variation from one frequency to the next. For example, if you're looking for a local average around bin k, you might average all the values from k minus 5 to k plus 5. Perhaps the trickiest bit of this is to make sure that you don't accidentally read off either end of the array. So pause the video here and see if you can add this peak detection to your spectrum plotter. All right then, here is our completed code which displays the audio spectrum using a circular buffer. We'll just start with some of the code that was already given to us. We've seen before the FFT object. This is a library that Bella provides to calculate FFTs. We can talk more about this in the next lecture. I've declared some constants for you in terms of the size of the FFT, which is to say the size of the window, and also the size of the hop, which is the interval between successive calculations. You've also been given a set of variables to describe the circular buffer. The first one of these is the size of the overall buffer. Now this is massively bigger than it needs to be at 16,384 samples, but that's partly deliberate to make sure that you're using your buffer code correctly. The buffer itself is declared as a C++ vector of type float as it was before, and again we have the right pointer which tells us where we are in the buffer. As we'll see, we use this differently than we did in the previous example. And then remember that we also needed a separate variable to keep track of the number of samples that had elapsed since the last hop. This variable will also be dealt with inside of render. Now remember that when we declare a C++ vector, we probably want to give it an initial size to avoid allocating memory inside of render, so this is the same idea as before. We're calling gInputBuffer.resize to make sure that it has the right number of elements inside of it. Nothing's actually changed here in the setup code compared to the example. Let's start by looking inside of render to see how the circular buffer works. Here we are inside of the for loop in render. Remember that everything that we do with our block-based processing should actually happen inside this for loop that counts through the number of audio frames in the block. We don't actually want to do any block-based processing here at the top of the render function because that makes certain assumptions about what the block size will be compared to the FFT hop size and window size, and we shouldn't make any assumptions about the real-time audio block size. <laughs> 
Anyway, inside of the for loop, we're getting a sample from the wave player, as we saw before. And initially, this looks very similar to how it did before. We're taking that sample and we're storing it inside the buffer and we're incrementing the pointer. We're also checking if the pointer has run off the end of the buffer, and if it has, then we reset the pointer back to zero. Now, the thing that's different here is that we are not calling process FFT here. This is not the end of the window. In the circular buffer, wrapping around from the end of the buffer back to the beginning carries no special meaning whatsoever. Instead, we have to be incrementing the hop counter. The hop counter is eventually going to reach the hop size, which is the interval between calculations, and when that happens, we reset that counter back to zero, and then we call process FFT. We're passing to the process FFT function the circular buffer and the pointer to the circular buffer, which tells us where the most recent sample is. As we'll see in a minute, it's very important that we know both of those things. Otherwise, the rest of this code is as it was before. So that's how we dealt with the circular buffer and the hop size. Now let's look at process FFT to see how we unwrap the buffer. Here we have our arguments to the process FFT function. We're passing in the buffer, which is a vector of type float, and the starting location, which is an integer. I'll come back to these variables in just a minute, but for the moment I want to go to this for loop because this is the code that unwraps the circular buffer. What we're going to do is we're going to take the contents of the circular buffer and we'll store it in this array called unwrapped buffer. And so we're starting from n equals zero, going up through the FFT size. And the tricky bit about this is the modulo arithmetic that tells us which index in the circular buffer we need to read from. That's this calculation right here. Now this is explained in a fair bit of detail in lecture 11, and the idea is basically the same here, which is to say that we know where our starting location is. This is where the right pointer is right now. And then what we need to do is we need to look backwards one window size. Then we need to step forward frame by frame from the sample that was one window size old. The rest of this expression here is just about handling the wraparound in the circular buffer. The modulo operator here is what takes numbers that are greater than the buffer size and wraps them around back towards zero. So remember that modulo gives us the remainder after division. But because modulo of a negative number produces a negative output, we also needed to add in the buffer size before we took the modulo. Again, all of this is explained in lecture 11. It's the very same idea here. So what we've done is that we have taken some of the contents of the circular buffer, we've unwrapped it, and we have stored it into this buffer called unwrapped buffer here. And that's what we are passing to the FFT. Once we've calculated the FFT, we can get its frequency bins by calling methods of the FFT object. Here what we're doing is we're calling the method FDA. This gives us the amplitude or magnitude of each of the bins, starting at n equals zero and going up to half the FFT size, as we saw before. We're storing all of that inside this other array called FFT current out, or basically the current output of the FFT. Now I'm going to skip this code for a minute because this is the second step that we looked at. Once we've calculated FFT current out, we can then send that to the GUI using the send buffer method that we saw before. So we can see that that is buffer index zero, and we are passing to it a vector of floats which holds the amplitude of the bins of the FFT. That's what the GUI is going to plot for us. Now, let's back up a little bit and talk about how we calculated the peak values here. First of all, back to the top of this file. Notice that I've declared these arrays with the keyword static. You will sometimes see this as an alternative to declaring global variables. What a static variable is, is something whose value does not change from one call to the function to the next. In other words, like a global variable, a static variable will be initialized at the beginning of the program, and its values will persist from one call to the function to the next. The main difference between this and actually using a global variable is that it's only accessible to the code within this function, so it's slightly neater from a coding perspective. I've chosen to use static variables here for a couple reasons. One is for calculating the peak, we do need to actually remember the values of the FFT from one call to process to the next. The other reason we do it is that these are potentially fairly large arrays, and we don't want to be allocating new memory every time we call process FFT. So making it a static variable means the memory is declared once at the beginning of the program and persists for the length of the program. So the variables we have then are FFT current out, which we saw. We also have a variable called FFT peak out. This is going to keep track of the peak values of each frequency bin. We saw unwrapped buffer before, which we use to unwrap the circular buffer and pass it to the FFT. And then we have this variable called decay rate, which we'll see in a minute. Let's now look at how we calculate the peak value of each frequency bin. All of that's down here in this block of code. <laughs> 
I'm first gonna skip over the local averaging code and just look at how we calculate the peak. The first thing that we do is we take the existing value of the peak for this particular frequency bin and we multiply it by the decay rate. This is going to cause the magnitude of the peak to gradually diminish in an exponential fashion. Then we check, is the value we just calculated greater than the peak we just recorded? If so, then we're going to update the peak to be equal to this new value we've calculated. Fine. Okay, how do we calculate the local average then? We start with a value of zero, then we're going to add to it inside this for loop each of 11 frequency bins, five below the index k up to five above the index k. And this value already contains the magnitudes of each of those frequency bins, because that's what we called here. There's one final wrinkle for this, which is that we want to make sure that we don't fall off the beginning of FFT current out the array. So we use these functions called standard max and standard min, which basically just calculate the maximum and minimum of two arguments. And this ensures that we're never going to have k be less than zero or greater than or equal to FFT size over two. Because that means that we might end up with fewer data points in our average, it's sensible to record exactly how many data points did end up in our average, and then we can divide by that at the end. So this is how we do frequency smoothing and peak detection. The last thing that we need to do is send that FFT buffer for the peak to the GUI, and you can see that we're giving it a different index so that the GUI code can tell the two of them apart. Before we run it, let's just have a look at the GUI code itself. This is this file called sketch.js. Now, again, I'm not going to get into the details of how to create a p5.js sketch here. I'm just going to look at how we deal with the data. This starts at the top of the function called draw. As before, we find the data from the Bella program inside this variable called bella.data.buffers. And for shorthand, we're going to store that in this local variable called buffers. This code here is just about checking whether any data has in fact been sent, because we expect it to be an array of different elements. If indeed we do have some data, then we can find out how long the first array is by calling buffer zero dot length. This is going to give us the FFT size. We're making an assumption in this code that each of the buffers we send to the GUI has the same size. Then later on, we write a for loop, which iterates through all the different buffers that have been sent to us. This syntax in JavaScript is slightly different than what we've seen in C++, and again, I'm not going to get into the details. Suffice it to say that the contents of this for loop draw a line which follows the magnitudes of each of the frequency bins. And this, plus the grid code that follows it, is what is going to give us the spectrum display. So with that, let's run the code and see how it looks. And we can go over here to the GUI. And there we go. We can see that the red plot gives us the current audio spectrum, and that the green plot gives us a local peak detection which gradually decays over time. Notice that the green plot is much smoother than the red plot. That is the effect of our local frequency averaging. So you can play around with this code, perhaps try some other variations, and use it to explore the capabilities of block-based processing and the ability to send data to the Bella GUI. There are quite a few other projects in the Bella examples that show other forms of communication to and from the GUI, so I encourage you to check those out if you're interested. So that brings us to the end of our block-based processing lecture. In the next one, we're going to see how we can use this to create interesting audio effects with the phase vocoder. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel so that you're notified of the new videos, or drop by any of our social media platforms or our websites. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.